Okay, does this appear good to you? Uh, Perfect, Dr. McDougall. All right. Uh, you know, I've been at this uh, for a long time. And uh, <clears throat> I would say that I've been pretty much a vegan since 1977. Uh, my the training, which allowed me to learn about good nutrition and proper medical care, took place between 1973 and 1976. At that time, the low-carb diets raged. Uh, there was only really one low-carb diet at that time, and that was supported by Atkins, but he wasn't the inventor. There, there was the beer drinker's diet 100 years ago and taught similar principles. If you really eat at the extremes, you'll make yourself sick and you won't eat. Well, anyway, I uh, wrote my first national best-selling book in about 1984. And my literary agent was Michael Cohen. And Michael Cohen happened to also be the literary agent for Dr. Robert Atkins. And he used to tell me, because Atkins went out of favor, that there's, you know, he couldn't sell any of his books. You know, he, he did because we'd swung to a high carbohydrate uh, uh, pendulum. And, and I was popular. I was on the New York Times best-selling list. And then, uh, Oh, I lost a little favor and uh, Atkins gained some favor. We had the great nutrition debate in the year 2000, where we had about 500 cameras looking at us. And Atkins and I debated along with uh, Dean Arnish and several other experts. And, you know, that was, that was probably a turning point in the year 2000, where uh, it was no longer McDougall and Arnish, uh, Bernard, et cetera, that uh, they got all the attention. In fact, I have to tell you, my literary agent, I was working for uh, uh, Penguin Dutton, and uh, they were among the top five booksellers in the world. And, uh, you know, they made a lot of money off me. I was among the top 5% of their their book sales uh, for a long time, a decade. And so I held great favor, but I'll, I'll never forget when my editor came to me in about uh, 1990 and said, you know, McDougall, you're kind of passe. You really got to change your diet style. You know, we're going to tell you that the the future is in low carb diets, and you're you're teaching a high carbohydrate diet. So if you want to stay with us, if you want to continue writing books, and I did continue writing books for them, then you need to switch your your uh, philosophy about about good eating. And I remember uh, telling Michael Hamilton, my editor. You know, uh, the science is solid. It couldn't possibly happen that, that the, the low carbs would rain. You know, people aren't that stupid. And I said, besides that, I said, I, you know, I don't do this just for money. I, I said, I, I do this because I really believe it's true. And I'm a medical doctor. And my responsibility is to help my patients be well. Well, anyway, uh, they were right and I was wrong. And as a result, we swang back to the low carb diets. And, you know, for many years, the last 20 years, I'd say we were low carb with various variations. And now they call them keto diets. And, uh, I, but I think, I think, listeners, I think the pendulum is about to swing back. You know, I see it in politics, I see it in communication, I see it in religion, I see it every place in the world. The truth is starting to dominate. People are no longer being fooled. We have available to us uh, these micro devices. 85% of people worldwide have cell phones. They can look up anything. They can look up to see whether or not somebody's lying through their teeth or they're telling the truth. Which brings me to a uh, website that I want you folks to pay particular attention to. I've been able to get the scientific research. I go to the National Library of Medicine and half of the articles are available. They're open access, but half of them uh, belong to various publishing companies and they charge you like $35 an article or more. And so, you know, the average person has not been able to get every bit of the research. And, you know, I'm heavy on research. I almost always put in the bottom right hand corner of the slides a reference or several references so you can look it up to see what the truth really is. Well, there is a new website that I want you to take notice. And I'm starting to use it all the time. You know, I no longer have to rely upon the medical schools that I'm associated with because I'm a, a, an assistant clinical professor 
at several medical schools, uh, I get access to their library. Now, I still use the resources, but boy, oh boy, if, if I'd have lost my professorship, you know, the, the biggest loss to me would have been access to the, the science. But, but it doesn't frighten me so much anymore because of the discovery of this particular site. Uh, this is Sci-Hub, and the address is right here. And you might have to fumble around a little bit. You can put in, uh, you can put in various uh, identifications of an article, such as its uh, citation or its, uh, the title of the article, or where there are various numbers that follow the articles that you can put in. And eventually, you'll get almost every article. I, I'm amazed at what you could get. And it's all 100% free because the people who've established this site, they believe that these articles should be available to everybody. And by the way, most of these articles were paid for by you and I. You know, that we paid the researchers either by buying products, hopefully not, we're not looking at that kind of research, but we are, or by our tax dollars. So they're ours, this, this knowledge is ours. So please take advantage of this and, and uh, you know, if, if anybody on the, your show, AJ, says something that you think is, uh, is needs to be brought out in more detail or questionable, uh, take the trouble to look it up. You know, the information is yours. Anyway, I've been dealing with the big sugar lies for, for more than half a century. Big sugar, that means you don't eat any sugar at all. Of course, white sugar, as you well know, I, I know white sugar is not good for you. Uh, white sugar is empty calories, you know, whether it be honey or molasses or maple syrup. And these are empty calories. And uh, as a result, they don't bring in a lot of other nutrients like protein and vitamins and minerals and so on. So in a sense, they, they rob the body of, of these other nutrients. So they're empty calories. Uh, they rot the teeth. Okay. And uh, you got to eat a, bu a bunch of sugar and it feeds the bacteria on your teeth. That's why I encourage people when they do get in contact with simple sugar that they rinse their mouth and, and or brush their teeth to get the sugar out of their mouth. And the third thing that they do is if you eat an abundance of, of sugar and, and even starches, you know, even if you eat uh, the, the kind of sugars that I do recommend, if you overfeed your subjects, to the point where they are stuffed, they don't want to eat anymore, they refuse to eat anymore, then the triglycerides go up. But otherwise, uh, you know, I've been teaching a high sugar diet for my entire career, which has been 46 years. But you understand what I say when I say sugar, right? Uh, complex carbohydrates, starches. Starches, you know, like rice and corn and potatoes. I'm not talking about table sugar or honey or molasses. I'm not talking about having a Coca-Cola. But you know what? In a comparison of Coca-Cola and drinking milk, I prefer that my children and grandchildren get Coca-Cola. But that's a whole other part of the discussion. As a matter of fact, what I'm going to present for you today is only a tease of the lecture that I gave on Saturday, this past Saturday in a series. And uh, that series is is about, let's see if we got here, here. No, that, that series is, is about, uh, about nutrition. I've given a uh, three, three of the four parts so far. There are four hour lectures and we're gonna do it again, but you can still get it on the last lecture, which is on vitamins and minerals. But uh, the first three were on protein, fats, and carbohydrates. I had a great, great time. Probably the, the more most fun I've had giving a lecture I was talking about carbohydrates last Saturday. I had a chance to speak to a group, a sellout crowd for four hours. So when we run that series again, you know, take advantage of it. It's going to be fun for you. Good education. But uh, anyway. All right. So uh, let's talk about low carbers. You know what I mean by low carb diets. I've been a just a ton of them. And, uh, you know, these days they, they go under the name of uh, keto diets, you know, various titles. And so they really identify the mechanism of how these diets work. Uh, keto diets, uh, you, you need to look up what keto means. Uh, keto means ketosis. Ketosis is what occurs when the body doesn't have any sugar to burn. What it burns is burns fat. 
in particular body fat. And a byproduct of fat metabolism is ketones. Ketones suppress the appetite. So the reason these diets have become so popular is, first of all, you lose water weight. You lose six, eight, 10 pounds the first week. Oh, nirvana. You, you finally found uh, the most perfect diet. And that's the diet that caused you to lose 10 pounds in a week. That's just water. And what happens because the body prefers to burn carbohydrate, it takes the glycogen out of your liver and muscles and burns that fur. Well, you store two pounds of glycogen in your liver's muscles. And associated with that two pounds of glycogen in the liver and muscles are uh, four pounds of water. Yeah, one, one, one molecule of, of uh, glycogen is associated with two molecules of water, you know, by weight. So you end up losing the glycogen and water weight, and, and you think this is the greatest diet you ever found, but that's just the first week. You're still feeling pretty good until you go into ketosis. And that's when you have to get more energy. You gotta get energy because you know, there's no more eating, no more sugar going on, or at least you're not eating any sugar. And uh, what you have to do then is you have to burn fat. You go into ketosis. Well, you know, the strong thing for you to understand is that ketones suppress the hunger drive. And I've heard people say, look, the keto diets are much more appetite satisfying. They're not appetite satisfying, they're appetite suppressing. Okay, they don't satisfy the appetite. They make you so sick that you don't want to eat. Now, ketosis occurs naturally under two circumstances. One is, uh, is when you starve to death. You know, it takes about 60 days to starve to death for the average person. Well, the first three days are miserable. You're in terrible pain. And then you go into ketosis, and because it suppresses the appetite, you're freed of that pain. And you can kind of figure out how to get yourself out of trouble. The, the other circumstance that you go into ketosis naturally and normally is when you get very sick. So you get a bad flu that lasts for, you know, many days. Then what happens is the body goes into ketosis. Why? Because you're supposed to be recuperating. You're not supposed to be finding and preparing food or eating. You're supposed to be recuperating. So this is one reason I call the, the keto diets the make yourself sick diets, because that's the mechanism they work by. They make you sick. You know, just like chemotherapy, cancer chemotherapy, you get the same results with cancer chemotherapy. Your appetite goes away, you lose weight, cholesterol comes down, blood pressure comes down, sugar comes down because you, you can't eat. Now, what doctor would brag about uh, having a diet program based around cancer chemotherapy? Come on. <laughs> Many of my colleagues promote make yourself sick keto diets. Anyway, uh, but most people don't stay on these diets for very long because they can't, they can't remain sick for very long. What they have to do is they have to go to the diet of the human being. Uh, the reason, another reason these things are so popular is because we have uh, uh, the food industry. If you're going to eat carbohydrates, then you're not going to be eating the things that make industry money. You're going to fill up on potatoes and rice and corn. And as a result, you're, they're going to sell less beef, less chicken less cheese, less fish and other seafood products. They, these industries are, are, are devastated if the idea that the proper way for human beings to eat is high in carbohydrate, there'd be no room left for their products. You stop buying them. There's a lot at stake. And so the, these people, they support the low carbers directly, indirectly. And in fact, they buy scientific professors, respected professors. In one of my newsletters, I believe it's April 2014, I talk about Dr. Lard, who's a professor at, at Oakland, atherosclerosis division of Oakland, who was bought by the cattle industry and the dairy industry. They got all the money, you, you know, it's just like politics. They just buy, and as a result, you suffer. So, you know, those are a couple of reasons why these diets are, are so popular, low carb, is that's where the money is. And uh, it may, it may be uh, you know, some people's idea of an, 
of a great diet because you lose that water weight the first week. And it's easy. I mean, the learning curve for low carbohydrates diets is really shallow. What you do is you uh, get in your car and drive through the, the fast food lane of your favorite restaurant and you order a meal. And what you do is you throw away the bun and scrape off the mustard and ketchup and pickles and you're on a low carb diet. Well, to do what we do takes a little effort, doesn't it? A little education. You have to get over some misinformation, which is what I want to talk to you about today. Some of the arguments that are, are used by the low carbers to convince you that it's okay to eat the diet that was never intended for the human being. The diet that makes you fat, sick, gives you cancer, heart disease, diabetes, osteoporosis, kidney stones, autoimmune diseases, et cetera. Okay, I want to go through a couple of population arguments uh, that uh, that you're confronted with all, all the time. I mean, I have been in my career, you know, since the 1970s. I, I'm sure you've heard about these things. So let me address a couple of uh, population studies that uh, promote low carb eating. Uh, there are two examples, and they both are about very small and underdeveloped, underdeveloped populations of people. The uh, first one is about the Inuit Eskimo. Uh, Inuit Eskimos eat the Atkins diet seven months of the year. Why? Because that's all that's available. You know, that, that's, they have to do that. And of course, that's the polar opposite of what I recommend. And uh, we have evidence that Inuits have been living in the frozen north for five, 6,000 years. But we only have reliable records on them from the mid-1800s. And the initial reports uh, were that these were beautiful people, athletic when young, but they aged quickly. And rarely did you see somebody over the age of 60. The average lifespan of an Inuit Eskimo was uh, 27 years of age. Now, wh what they say is they say that, uh, that the Inuits are immune from common chronic diseases, like they specifically named heart disease, cancer, and most chronic diseases. Well, let's take a look at the evidence. Here's the diet. It's a, a diet that's high cholesterol, high fat, high protein, low calcium because it's based on meat. There's almost no calcium at all. Low in fiber, low the vitamin C is essentially absent. You know, the, the reason that the Inuit Eskimo survives at all because of deficiencies in eating flesh is because they eat the intestinal contents of the kill of the animals. And the fish and the, the mammals, they'll have a whole bunch of plant products in their bellies and their intestines, which the Inuit Eskimo takes advantage of and they prevent problems like severe scurvy. Uh, there is a, a, a rumor that that the Inuit Eskimo has no heart disease. And uh, this prevailed in the 1970s in the explanation because clinically, clinically you, you didn't see heart attacks in these people. Well, maybe part of it was their average age was uh, of, at the time of death, like the lifespan was 27 years. Maybe they didn't live old, old enough to get heart disease, but there are some people who live to be quite old and they didn't see clinical heart disease. Clinical heart disease, what I mean by that is you know, a heart attack or an e, you take an EKG, you see the evidence of an infarct. Or you look, you do an autopsy um, an, uh, as opposed to doing an autopsy. Um, it, it, it just clinically, you don't see it on the population. But when you look, look deeper, what you find is that's not the case as we're gonna go over in the next couple of slides. And the explanation as to why uh, the Inuit Eskimo did not have heart disease is because they ate a lot of fish which means they ate a lot of omega-3s. Omega-3s thin the blood, as we talked about about a couple of months ago. They thin the blood, and they prevent a blood clot from forming in your arteries, like your heart arteries. But they, they thin the blood, and they also cause the Eskimo to bleed, fatally bleed. They have a history of having fatal nosebleeds. But that's irrelevant. You know, the excuse being is you don't see heart attacks because even though you may have rotten arteries, uh, they when they explode, when they 
first, uh, you, you don't form a blood clot, which is what happens when you have a heart attack. Well, let's take a look at uh, some of the other research. Uh, in this uh, particular extensive paper published in atherosclerosis in 2003, uh, titled The Low Incidence of Cardiovascular Disease Among the Inuit, what is the evidence? And when they did a thorough review of the scientific evidence, they found that the, Eskimo, the Eskimos have a similar prevalence of coronary artery disease as non-Eskimo populations. They have excessive strokes, overall twice the mortality, life expectancy is approximately 10 years shorter than the Danish population. Now that's, that's looking at the rest of the evidence. And then some important evidence goes back as, as, as long as 4,000 years ago. Now living in that cold environment, you know, when people died and were buried in the tundra, they were preserved for thousands of years. They were mummified. And uh, when these mummies uh, were exhumed and examined by autopsy or by CAT scans, what they found is mummies dating back into an Eskimos. 2,000 years had extensive atherosclerosis. You can see the calcifications here in the arteries. Okay, so they had they had very sick arterial system. They just didn't have clinical art, uh, clinical heart disease, probably because, as I told you, they, they didn't live long enough. And they ate a lot of omega-3 fats, which thinned the blood, which is not necessarily a good thing. Now, as far as the cancer issue, why didn't they have a, a lot of cancers that traditionally knew it? It may have to do with the, the, the low bacteria count in the environment. You know, some of the cancer processes involve bacteria that are are not present in the uh, environment of the U.S. Eskimo. There's a lot of theories. As far as other diseases in this population of people, uh, let me refer to this National Geographic article in 1987. Uh, this is an article about two women who were uh, sitting in their hut and an ice flow fell on top of them. And they were entombed in ice for 500 years. And then they were found. One was estimated to be in her 20s, one was estimated to be in her 40s. They showed signs of severe osteoporosis from their high animal food diet, as we've talked about many times. And they also suffered atherosclerosis. And this article says probably the result of the heavy diet of whale and seal blubber. Seal blubber. There's no paradox here. You know, if you eat these kinds of foods, these low carb foods, you're going to be sick. As far as looking at the osteoporosis risks in Inuit Eskimos, uh, here's an important study that found when they did bone mineral density tests that the Inuit Eskimo compared to say women who lived in Canada or the United States, they had 10, 10 to 15% greater deficit. In other words, greater loss of bone. Show me a Show me research that shows otherwise, come on. And uh, in addition to the problems we talked about is my experience with people who live in that part of the world, which is, you know, I've had some experience in trouble. We actually took, we took uh, three adventure trips up to Alaska and I uh, got a chance to, you know, get mildly exposed to the population up there. Plus I know a lot of dentists and doctors who work up in Alaska. And, you know, they tell me, as the research shows, that these are some of the most obese and sickly people with the most rotten teeth. Now, you know, it's, it's not because of the traditional Inuit diet that most of the problems have occurred. It's because they don't live like they used to. You know, to survive 150 years ago or 100 years ago, even 50 years ago, well, probably a little longer than 50 years ago, uh, you, you lived in an igloo. You had to spear and catch by line your meals. This was an, a really difficult environment to live in. These people burned 7,000 calories a day. You could not follow the McDougall diet and live in that kind of environment. This is the extremes of the environment they lived in. And they had to eat this kind of diet to survive. But, you know, Nowadays, they've changed everything because of modern living. 
you know, they, uh, they uh, instead they live in houses that are heated and they drive around in heated SUVs and they go to the fast food restaurant and they go fishing with a green lure. You, you know what a green lure is, right? You know, you hand a green lure to the guy behind the counter and get a fish sandwich. So anyways, it's a sad situation. Uh, the Inuit Eskimos, because of their eat foods high on the food chain, the modern Eskimo, uh, they are horribly polluted uh, to, uh, the, to the point where PCBs in their breast milk are five to 10 times higher than women in Southern Canada because of the foods they eat. And uh, breast milk and tissues of some Greenlanders are, are classified as hazardous waste and they need to be buried in a waste dump. So these, these people are in terrible, terrible shape because of modern living and they have tried to live like traditional Eskimos. But we have that problem here in the Northwest. You know, we have tribes of, uh, of the native people who have been granted extra fishing rights, you know, which, you know, I'm not gonna comment on it, but in some ways uh, that's justified. But the problem is the fish are so contaminated it's a health risk for modern day people living in Portland and Washington to consume these fish. Methylmercury, resistant organic pollutants, POPs. You know, it's, it, anyway, okay, that, that's one example that the low carbs will give you as to justify why you can and should be following a low carb diet. The Inuit Eskimos do, and look how healthy they are. Excuse me. Well, the other population that comes up a lot is the Maasai in uh, Africa. They're in Kenya and northern Tanzania. And uh, they have a tradition of uh, living on milk, meat, and blood after puberty, the males. And uh, this is a diet that's uh, two-thirds of the calories from fat and contains 600 to 2,000 milligrams of cholesterol a day. Now, these are herdsmen. They, they herd sheep, and that's what they do. They walk all day long. So they have a high level of exercise. A fellow by the name of George Mann, <clears throat> he went uh, to this particular area under, with the encouragement of the meat industry, by the way. Uh, they, they paid for his studies and his trip. And jo George Mann, who was a respected scientist in the 70s and 60s, uh, he, he decided to go study these people to explain the paradox of the Maasai. Here they eat a diet that all the evidence said would give you a terrible heart disease and all kinds of other health problems. At least almost everybody agreed upon this. And yet they lived on that very diet and they had no heart disease. They looked at 600 men, 350 of them over the age of 40 years, and they found very little clinical heart disease. In other words, they didn't see people having heart attacks. They did EKGs on these particular people, and they uh, found one equivocal EKG in 300 feet, 300, 600 men. That's all. And so George Mann came back and said, well, it's true, you don't get heart disease. And it's likely because these people, uh, these people were so, so heavily exercised. So that was their whole life. And uh, when George Mann went back and he reported his uh, research in a couple of places, one was in the American Journal of Epidemiology in 1972. And what they did is they looked at the hearts and the aortas of 50 Maasai men at autopsy. And the aortas showed extensive atherosclerosis and animal th uh, thickening equal to that of, uh, of adults in the US the same age. Uh, George Mann published an article in the New England Journal of Medicine, Diet, Heart, End of an Era. And he explained there, for e every age group, they had worse arteries than a, a male living in the United States. Diet, Heart, End of an Era, New England Journal of Medicine. No paradox, folks. Small populations of people easily explained uh, what, what the early findings are. Don't be fooled. Now, uh, on the other side, and I'm only gonna show you a small amount of the, the evidence, and just, to, just to give you a touch, just to whet your appetite. 
But if you look at the archaeologic evidence that's been published in the last 40 years, you're going to find consistently what I'm going to show you right now. Without exception, you find me an article that says otherwise than what I'm going to show you right now. The reason earlier archaeologists were confused, well, let, 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 excuse me, let me talk about, uh, about a, a, a kind of diet in a famous diet book, the Paleo Diet by Lauren Cordain. And a lot of your friends and relatives follow. This is another low-carb diet. Uh, there's some good things about the diet in the sense that they tell you no dairy products, sugar, salt, or processed oils, except olive oil. But the bad thing about the diet is, is they say you should just eat uh, loads of meat. In fact, you can eat, eat endangered wild, wild animals and be on the paleo diet. That's what Lord Cordain says. And he says the basic theory behind the paleo diet is more than 2 million years of evolution of hunters and gatherers. To, he, excuse me, he's not reading the literature. This statement, his book is before the agricultural revolution 10,000 years ago, there wasn't a single person who did not follow the paleo diet. That's a nonsense that you get on the books. And as far as hunter-gatherer, this is sexism at its worst. You know, who did the hunting? Who got the glory? Come on, no, you know the answer to that. The men all went out and they tried to kill something. Maybe they did. And maybe they were lucky enough to get it back in time before it rotted. But who, who obtained the calories for this village, this population? It was the grandparents, the women, the children, the gatherers, who have never gotten any glory, have they? Sexism. Anyway, uh, Lauren Cordain is uh, absolutely wrong and is... In his data, in his book, I've gone through in great detail the discussion of the paleo diet. You'll find that on my website. <clears throat> the reason that uh, early archaeologists, say below before 40 years ago, were confused is because they would go to a, you know, a, a fire pit, and they would examine what they found at, uh, say, where the food was cooked. And what they found was they found bones. And they found tools that were used to cut the animals. And they even found uh, uh, knife cuts on the bones. They didn't find any pea pods, any, any potato skins, any corn husks, not a one. And so they came to the conclusion that obviously meat was the predominant part of the diet. By, by this coarse examination, which is not held by any researcher these days, no exceptions. And I'm assuming the old farts have died out, but maybe not. But let's take a look at some of the research that has been done recently. Uh, in Africa, they found uh, root vegetables, uh, starchy foods, in a cave that was uh, harboring a population in Africa 170,000 years ago. Anyway, they lived on, on underground storage organs. That's what they lived on. And that's, that's Homo sapiens. And here's another population out of Africa, which of course, you know, our heritage is out of Africa. This is uh, Mozambique. And uh, what they did is they examined the tools and they found, uh, they found uh, grass seeds and, and other types of granules from, from plants on the tools. And, uh, they even found evidence that they consumed uh, underground storage organs like potatoes. Well, they wouldn't be potatoes, they'd be bulbs and corms and other types of things. The potato <clears throat> was, was a later introduction to the, or what would you consider a potato, later introduction to the populations. Anyway, those, those are in humans. And then we have Neanderthals, which date back 600,000 years. There's a couple of research papers. One looked at the teeth of Neanderthals and they looked at the dental calculus and they found evidence of, uh, of grains and, and evidence of the kind of bacteria that digest starches on their teeth. 
And they even looked at their poop from 50,000 years ago for the Neanderthals. And they found evidence of, of in their petrified feces of all kinds of starch. So see, that, that's what modern uh, archaeology is all about. It's about you know, more sophisticated examinations of the findings. And it goes on and on and on. Uh, in Papua New Guinea, you have people living for 50 to 60,000 years, and a dominant part of their eating has been sweet potatoes. Today, the people in Papua New Guinea still live on, on a diet that's 92% sweet potatoes, leaves and roots. 92% of their food is sweet potatoes in the highlands. And they're in excellent health, uh, cholesterol 153, no diabetes, no gout, no heart disease. Yeah. Not just by clinical examination, by thorough examination. But of course, those are people who have changed the modern diet. They've lost this immunity. And that's an easy thing for people to do these days because of, because of our communication worldwide. Uh, my native land, Hawaii. Uh, the Hawaiians, uh, they lived on, on taro. That was the predominant food. And which is turned into poi and breadfruit and sweet potatoes and bananas and leafy vegetables. And they had some pigs, but and for religious sacrifice. They didn't really start eating animals, uh, pigs and dogs and chickens until the missionaries came in the 1800s. And now we have a situation where the Hawaiians are some of the most sick people in the United States, some of the most overweight people, the highest rates of heart disease and cancer and diabetes because they've enthusiastically adopted the Western diet. But for you know, thousands of years, they didn't. Uh, let's go to South America, just, just south of Santiago, uh, Chile. There's a, uh, a site, it's a Monte Verde excavation site. And it's unique in the sense that it's a peat bog. And so it preserves organic material. You know, not not just uh, you know the petrified feces and but, um, you know they really they they have actual plants like here you see a couple of potatoes. This is the early evidence of potato eating. It was uh, fourteen hundred years ago. You know, long before Lauren Cordain suggested that not a single person ever ate anything but the paleo diet. Uh, we went to Peru. It was kind of an interesting experience. We took a, an adventure group, and uh, many of you had a chance to go on our adventure trips. And uh, who knows, we may do them again. We went, and we took, uh, oh, I don't know, three, 4,000 people to uh, various places in uh, Central America and South America and spent some time in Hawaii. And we took these people on, on vacations because, you know, when you follow the McDougall diet, it's uh, really hard to eat, eat when you tra travel. And so what we uh, decided to do was to start running these adventure trips. And they were very successful. We run probably 30 different trips. And one of the trips that we took was to Peru. And we visited Lake Titicaca. Some of you may be able to recognize this woman right here. This is Ann Wheat. If some of you know Ann Wheat. That's Ann Wheat right there in, in the picture. And Larry and I and Ann uh, and Mary, my wife, uh, we walked on these... Uh, on, on these pads that are floating on the Lake Titicaca. You know, these are made of reeds. That's what the islands are made of. And you see all these people uh, in their tents and they're selling various uh, art of, arts that they've made. And one of the things that we noticed was that the women were overweight. The men weren't, but the women were. So you know, I said to Larry, I'm gonna go ask one of the men why their women are all overweight. He says, you better not. And I said, I, I, re, I, I don't remember what I did. But, <clears throat> but, but the explanation was, was obvious is they lived on a lake and what they lived on was fish. There's no paradox here. Uh, in our trip through Peru, what we found is we found people to toiling in the fields, uh, growing potatoes. And you know, in that part of the world, there are you know, 400 to 600 different species of potatoes. And the people in that part of the world, they uh, they enjoyed health that we only enjoyed 120 years ago. 
know, they have infectious disease problems, but they don't have the heart disease and the cancers even today that we have. We, we can compare their health today to what we had 120 years ago. Anyway, we had a, a really a good time. Um, we, um, in our trip, we, you know, we got a lot of history about Peru and the fact that the diet of uh, Peru, the people in Peru and the Andes was primarily potatoes. And they had a kind of a unique situation. That is, they were able to, um, to freeze dry their potatoes and put them away for times that were difficult. And the reason they were able to do this is because they lived in the Andes. So at night, it was very cold and froze up in the mountains. And so you had uh, freeze potatoes, frozen potatoes. And then in the daytime, it became very hot and they dried out. So you pr produced free freeze dried potatoes, which are called chuño, which will last for 10 years under dry circumstances. And you know that's how dependent these people were on but potatoes. Now in our trip, our adventure trip, the, we, we noticed something else. You know, everybody was trim and strong and healthy looking, except when we went to the restaurants. Then the waiters and the chefs were overweight. But what do you think that happened? No paradox here. Uh, the uh, Native Americans, uh, there's um, evidence that at the Four Corners, which is we have four states coming together, Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico. They have uh, found uh, four corner potatoes. That's what they call it, four corner potatoes. And they date back 12,000 years for uh, the Native Americans in that area. And of course they ate a lot of corn. Uh, this is a coin that I have passed out over the years. And you can still get them, they're, they're US dollar coins. They, I think they're $3 now, but they tell a story. Uh, they tell a story on the tale about the three sisters. The three sisters are corn, beans, and rice. That was the diet of the Native Americans. Corn, beans, and rice. And in other parts, uh, potatoes were a dominant part of their eating too. Now for, for 10,000 years, rice has been the dominant source of calories that drove civilization in that part of the world. They're the engines of civilization are starchy foods. That, that, kind of, that kind of thinking is even preserved today. Uh, you recognize if I talk to you about people living in Asia, I think most of you will still, will still comment about how trim and how they live on rice. In fact, before 1980, <clears throat> 90% of the people in China lived on white rice. That, that, excuse me, let, let me say, that's true what I just said, but let me say it another way. 90% of the food consumed in China before 1980 was white rice. And of course that's changed in the last 40 years. If you look at the wealthy Chinese people or Vietnamese people or Thailand people, you know, the business people, what you find is you find very overweight, sickly people. No paradox here. But still, there's a lot of tradition in rice eating in your Asian countries. In Japan, uh, the word for cooked rice is uh, gohan, which means meal. And uh, they have a word for uh, morning rice for, for breakfast. And in China, <laughs> the word for rice is the same word for food. There's a saying, a meal without rice is like a beautiful woman with only one eye. And uh, the uh, typical greeting among Chinese people today is like we say, no, how are you? They say, have you had your rice today? In India, rice is the first food a new bride offers her husband. And in Indonesia, no marriage is recognized until she can skillfully prepare rice. Uh, the people of the corn. You know, in Central America, you know, we have the Aztecs and the Mayans. Uh, they, they had civilizations that date back 13,000 years. And, and they're known as the people of the corn. They fought battles. 
they did at their athletic events. They had children. They, they survived on corn. Another example of engines of civilization, another starch is uh, in the Middle East. It's wheat and barley. It's the breadbasket of the world. Still, it's called the breadbasket of the world. And that's what these people survived on, except for the pharaohs and the priests and priestess. They would feed their portion of, uh, of barley and wheat. They'd feed it to pigs and birds and sheep and cows, and they'd eat the rich food. Well, the evidence clearly says, and when you look at uh, mummies, you, know, you look at uh, the people who were buried in the, in the pyramids 2,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, they show extensive atherosclerosis all throughout their entire artery system. They, they show obesity. They have birth defects that are tied to the mother eating the Western diet. No paradox here. And let's just end this presentation by talking about <clears throat> something that's personal to a lot of you folks, and that's your religious teachings, which go back thousands of years. You know, if it wasn't true, they'd have thrown it out of your books of religion, don't you think? They wouldn't put such emphasis on it. And I've, I've only touched on a couple of examples here that I gave in the presentation uh, last Saturday. You know, just kind of get your interest, what your appetite, let you understand that there's a lot to be learned out here, and you can learn it. Uh, Genesis 1, God said, behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth. And every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be your food. The Latter-day Saints, uh, religion that's been around for almost 200 years now. <clears throat> they have something called the Doctrine of Covenants, which is the, you know, the rules of living of uh, the Mormons. And uh, Doctrine of Covenants number 89, which uh, a lot of the Mormons don't like to hear. You know, they don't like to believe it, but it's true. It says, all, all grain is ordained for the use of man and a beast. And these meats hath God made for use of man only in times of famine and excess hunger. How about the teachings of Buddha? The eating of meat extinguishes the seed of great kindness. And to become a vegetarian is to step into the stream which leads to nirvana. You know, it's there, there aren't any exceptions, ladies and gentlemen. You find me a religious teaching that advocates a low-carb diet. So what it comes down is that the human being is a star cheater. Uh, we always have, we always will be star cheaters. Whether or not we get, we get off track by the food industry or by the low carb dieting people, it ain't gonna change. You know, essentially 99% of the people who have ever walked this earth have obtained the bulk of their calories from starch. Wherever you look, no matter how far back you examine it, you go back two and a half million years and see where prehumans, hominids, obtained the bulk of their calories from starch. Hopefully you won't you won't uh, put up with all the lion, 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 lion. Anyway, uh, just wanted to give you a, a touch of. Uh, of information about uh, low carb diets and the nonsense they teach. There's just, you know, there's three hours more that I gave on Saturday about this, what you should know. And we run a series, the series uh, is almost over. It's protein, fats, sugars, and starches. And the next, uh, in two weeks, we're gonna do one on vitamins. And I wanna encourage all of you, if you wanna get your health back, you want to get your personal appearance back. You want to get off your medications. You want to get living again. Let us help you. We run the most effective program in the world, which is a telemedicine program. We come right into your home. It's 12 days. 
you know, it's, it's something that I developed after many years of doing the program live. Oh, we do this live too, but I mean, in, in person where you had to travel to California to get the kind of care that I offer. For 16 years, I ran the program at St. Lena Hospital. For 18 years, I ran the program in California, in Santa Rosa, California for 18 years. And with the pandemic, one of the good things that happened is we were put in a situation where we had to change the way we delivered this message. But it all came out positive. This is a more effective program, more support. You know, we go into your homes. Our doctor does. We offer telemedicine. You know, daily interaction if that's what's necessary. You know, every every day, you know, sometimes all day long, sometimes just in the morning. Our support specialists, uh, they talk to you about your blood sugar, your blood pressure. You know, how you're doing. What are you going to have today? You know, what can we work out for you as far as what you're going to eat for lunch when you go out with your friends today? You know, we're there for help you. And Dr. Doug Lyle, who I see was on recently, he teaches our psychological part. And Jeff Novick, who's the best dietitian in the world, he teaches our, our dietetic part. And Heather teaches and Chef AJ teaches. And we just have an amazing staff. You know, people walk away from the program and they say that's the best money and time they ever spent. And they, they can't understand why we haven't taken over the world. You know, why, why are the low carbohydrate diets raining? Well, I'll tell you why they're raining, because they got all the money. They own the politicians. You know, it's just, it's super sad because we're, we're not talking about a television set that is <clears throat> unrepairable. We're talking about your children and your spouse and your parents and you by being lied to, by incorrect care and repair. Anyway, we can correct that for you. Uh, the next 12-day uh, program we run is in uh, January of uh, 2023.